Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to this new Friday talk that we do weekly at the ICM. Um, this talk today is a special one as it's part of, a, of the series of Sea Symposium dealing with new frontiers in marine, of marine research and which is a, a cycle of conferences organized by the centers from the TSIC that works in marine sciences. Each month is, or, uh, is in charge of organiz organizing the, the, the symposium and today is our part from the Institute of Sciences del Mar. And today we have Marta, Marta Coy as a speaker, who's a senior researcher working here at the Institute. Marta Coy graduated in environmental science at the Autonomous University of Barcelona in 2000. And then she did a PhD in, in collaboration between the Autonomous University and the ICM that she presented in 2006. And since then, she, she had a, a long postdoc period uh, with the stage abroad in Canada, in Italy, and South Africa, until she incorporated here at the ICM in 2016. Marte, she's, she's very active. She participates and coordinates in a lot of uh, research projects. She is supervising a lot of students, uh, and she also teaches courses on marine ecology and ecosystem modeling. Um, I think her main research topic focuses in understanding the patterns and processes that characterize marine ecosystems, and in particular, changes and threats on marine biodiversity. So she will talk about part of what she's doing today in this talk. Uh, for all the, uh, the people who is attending, just remember that uh, in this talk, um, we don't give voice to the attendants. But if you have comments or questions, you can write them in the chat. And after the talk, we will visit the chat and try to address as much as we can all these comments. So Marta, thank you for being here. And Stage. Okay, thank you very much. Gracias, Ramon, and uh, welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here today to, to present some of the recent work that we have been doing in, in my group at the Institute of Marine Science. And um, well, basically, I'll, I'll start with uh, what I would like to show you today, which is, uh, let me see. Okay. Yes, perfect. So basically, it's a frame in, in three consecutive projects that, that we had in the group, Spelmet, Pelweb, and Pelcat, that aimed at uh, improving the understanding that we have about the small pelagic fish in the, in the Western Mediterranean, and then integrating the knowledge that we would gather into a multi-modeling platform to quantify what have been the impacts of the changes that we are observing and try to understand the future uh, trajectories of change that we are going to witness in the future. These three projects have been complementary, dealing with uh, studies about genetics, uh, about uh, biology and ecology of the species, about uh, fisheries uh, ecology, and also about the socioeconomics. And um, even we have been analyzing uh, or getting into the problematic of uh, pollution and, and plastics in, in the last one in Pelcat. And uh, before going on with my presentation, I would really like to, to thank all the uh, funding agencies, so the European Union, the Spanish government, and the Catalan government for the funding that they have been giving us to uh, complement and to, to look at this, uh, these topics. So the, the project that, uh, or, or the, the three projects that uh, at the end, the main goal was uh, uh, to try to identify what has been happening with these uh, species in the in the Western Mediterranean, in the, in the Spanish Western Mediterranean area, and looking, for example, at uh, traits in body condition, abundance distribution, also at uh, changes in, in, in trophism, if what they eat. Then uh, quantifying what has been the impact of these ecological changes and socioeconomic, uh, also in terms of the ecological, but also socioeconomic consequences in the ecosystem and looking from a, a wide uh, ecosystem perspective. So looking at, uh, at uh, these species, but also taking into account the, the predators, both natural predators and the fisheries, and also the, uh, the environment and the, the whole socioeconomic system that evolve around them. And finally, the third main goal was then to to, to be in a position to analyze or start analyzing which are the most robust uh, management options that we have to achieve a, re a resilient um, and healthy uh, small pelagic fish population and uh, how, to uh, how to exploit them sustainably in the future, accounting for the fact that climate change is, uh, is a reality already in our area. 
So my, my aim today is give you a background and uh, about, uh, about the topic and the methodology that we have been using to give you a broad overview. Then I'm going to center in, uh, in showing you, showcasing some of the sectorial studies that we have been um, conducting in these uh, different projects. I will be brief, but most of them are or published or in process of being, of being in a publication. And each of them could be a talk by themselves. So I'll try to just showcase these, these studies. And then I'm going to bring you into how we have been uh, trying to integrate all this knowledge in a, in a multi-modeling platform or, or a, what we call a marine ecosystem model and what we have learned from, from the process. Before getting into the specifics of, uh, of our study, let me bring you to the pelagic uh, ecosystem. You know that 70% of the Earth is covered by, by the ocean and a vast percentage of this, um, of this ocean is, uh, is the, the pelagic system. And um, basically, the pelagic system is much less known than the demersal system and it's actually identified as one of uh, or contributing and continue um, Gaining knowledge about the system is one of the ocean science challenges for 2030 that they seek and other agencies have been identifying in this uh, for this new new decade of the oceans. And uh, in the pelagic system, we have obviously different organisms. We have the plankton and the nekton. And within the nekton, we have what we call the forage uh, organisms, which include forage fish and invertebrates, which are very important elements of the system because they, they channel energy from uh, what we call lower trophic level, from the plankton up to the predators. And they also control or they are um, exerting uh, top-down processes in the plankton themselves. So trying to understand the role that these forage species play in the system is, is a crucial one. And they are um, most of the times or in many regions less understood than the, the Mercer counteract counterparts. The pelagic uh, um, forage species or and and within these forage species obviously the, the forage fish species include small and medium pelagics like anchovies, sardines, horse mackerels, and other small fish and invertebrates like uh, squids, uh, shrimps, etc. And they are key components of the systems because they, as I said, they, they are Pre, uh, preys of many predators, commercial and non-commercial predators in our oceans, and they also contribute substantial to, substantially to the global fisheries. So for example, here you see the the data of the the total catches from the sea around us in 2016. You can see that many of the categories in, include pelagic uh, organisms, medium and uh, small and large pelagic organisms. So the um, these forage uh, fish species and forage species are, are very important for, for different reasons. The pelagic ecosystem um, is changing and uh, it's happening um, also in the demersal, but we also see changes in, in the pelagic systems. They are per se very dynamic and these systems tend to, to show um, high oscillations. They have been, although changing historically, systematically and they are changing now and these changing uh, changes seem to be accelerating in some places so we see many uh, species declines and especially large organisms with this low growth are declining in several places in the world but we also see other species that are increasing in the pelagic system we saw we see especially smaller organisms with high turnover rates that are uh, proliferating or increasing in the in the fisheries uh, data or in the survey data and here and um, uh, in the left you see an example of um, of changes or uh, documenting changes in in jellyfish and in the in the right you see changes of some study that uh, documents changes in in cephalopods in fisheries and in survey data so who is to blame for that? Who is the, the driver or who are the drivers uh, um, beneath these changes in the pelagic systems? As I said, the, the systems per se are very dynamic and there's a climate variability that uh, affects their, their special temporal dynamics. But we also see climate change affecting them. There's these long-term physical and oceanographic changes that we are um, um, starting to, to understand that that's happening in the ocean. You see a figure in the, in the left, in the down left, where you see projections, the historical and the projections um, for tra trajectories of uh, sea surface temperature and also uh, net primary production. 
taking into account different R system models and different uh, RCP scenarios, so representative concentration pathway scenarios of how climate change may evolve in the future. And those changes in the physical conditions are obviously affecting the, the pelagic system from the lower trophic level to the higher trophic level. We also have human activities that have long-term uh, effects, like for example, fishing. And you have a figure on the, the, the two figures on the top represent the changes in the, in the fishing effort in, in European seas in terms of the nominal fishing effort, but also the effective fishing effort, um, accounting for a technology creep of 2.6% annually. And you can see the, the increases that have been in terms of the, of the of the effort both for the artisanal fisheries in dash lines and for industrial fisheries in in dot lines and uh, on the other uh, little figure here you see the um, basically the um, cpues or the the trends in in some of the abundance per unit of effort of uh, of the of the catches on the bottom, you see the importance of uh, the forage fish in the in in the catches, as I said before, and this trajectory that has been increasing substantially since 1950s to this figure finishes in 2010, but basically continues uh, high uh, to nowadays. And obviously, we have the cumulative effects that these uh, climate changes and human activities are having on the on the pelagic system. The Western Mediterranean is also changing. It's not, uh, uh, it's not an exception. And we are seeing decline of commercial species. Um, for example, you have at the bottom uh, right, you have a change, bottom left, sorry, you have changes in, in the catches that we had in 1950s uh, for, uh, for commercial species of anchovy sardine. You also have uh, uh, the round sardinella there also shown. We have seen invasive uh, in increases and in proliferation of some species. For, for example, Sardinella in our area has been shown to be uh, moving north in, in some uh, in some areas of the Mediterranean and also in the Northwestern Mediterranean. We uh, have been registering numerous invasions in the Western Mediterranean, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, but also arriving to the Western. And these are because changes in climate conditions. You see, you should, you see it here in the uh, bottom right, uh, some trends or some projections of, of changes in the sea surface temperature in our area under different scenarios of climate change and RCP, so RCP is uh, uh, 2.6 to 8.5, and also changes in human activities. You see in the middle, um, in the middle figure, you see changes or the projections of fishing effort in uh, in a harbor in the region, in Blanes Harbor, where you, where we have been studying how the the nominal effort compared to the effective effort has been changing with time. So what is happening in our system? These changes are, are really uh, in the media as well, and we see them. We see them in the data, but they are also um, showcased in or appear sometimes in the media. And they have been appearing since. Uh, um, is, this is not recent. There's a uh, example. The, the first uh, um, news that I'm showing to you uh, here. It's from. Um, 2016, for example, where they say that uh, there's uh, th there's not so much anchovy and sardine catches in the in the harbors, for example. There has been uh, news about the small the pelagics are have uh, showing small sizes, uh, small pelagic fish, and but there's also uh, news about proliferation, for example, of jellyfish or recent recoveries of predators or proliferation of predators that seem to be or um, the fishermen are related them relating them to these uh, declines in the small pelagics that we are seeing. So all in all, we have uh, several hypotheses, or we started this, this project that I'm going to show you today with hypotheses of what has been, what may have been happening in the pelagic system in our area. Of course, the historical catches in anchovy and sardine landings have been attributed to an increase in the fishing effort and the current high rate of exploitation. So that would be one hypothesis that fishing impacts are driving the changes. Um, also, there's uh, some changes that have been related to environmental factors that are really affecting recruitment, growth, and condition of, uh, of the small pelagic uh, fishes. And also, the role of climate change affecting the composition of plankton has been also suggested to, to be an important factor um, conditioning the, the changes that, that we are seeing. For example, we have been studying that, studying that through, through studies of, uh, of diets of these species. 
Other causes have been related to the recovery of predators, as I, as I mentioned before, for example, landing bluefin tuna, com uh, competitors, for example, what would be uh, uh, the increase or of uh, sardinella aurita, of the run sardinella that may be competing for, for zooplankton. And there's also other, other hypotheses that related changes to diseases and, uh, and parasites, or even to the occurrence of, uh, of pollution and the and uh, the impact that, that, for example, plastics may have in, in these species. <clears throat> so we started looking at the different uh, hypotheses and trying to later on integrate them in a framework. But of course, we did not start from scratch. And there has been a lot of work already in the, in the region, starting uh, from the 80s with the work done by Isabel Palomera, and uh, and uh, his and colleagues in in that time looking at the um, reproduction ecology and the fisheries biology of of anchovy in the in the area and all the way to the work that for example Marta Lubo has been doing in terms of the trophic ecology the energy content and the transfer of energy of the small pelagics up and down the food web so there has been a long um, um, a long stand of of projects and and studies that have already been looking at some of these aspects of the, of the changes in our region. However, there were important gaps, uh, information gaps that we wanted to address. For example, um, there were gaps in terms of the species differentiation in the, in the uh, population genetics of the studies, of the species, sorry, and uh, also in some key aspects of the biology in terms of body condition, reproduction, growth and mortality, distribution and abundance, and the environmental factors and preferences that are uh, affecting them. So we have been looking at those factors, especially for anchovy and sardine. And we have also been looking at uh, some aspects of the ecology, looking at the trophic behavior of, uh, of these species, but also of uh, um, the competitors, potential competitors, as uh, Ron Sardinella, or uh, predators as well, for example, the, the little tunis, or some demersal predators like hake. And we included as well in our studies the role and some of the impacts that fisheries may be having in these species. At the end, the idea was to integrate all the information, previous information from the area with these uh, gaps that we were trying to, to fill in a, um, in a sociology um, integrated study that would allow us to look at this, uh, how the species have changed, what have been the consequences of these changes in ecosystem components, in fisheries, and then try to, to use this uh, multi-modeling platform to project the um, the fisheries and the climate change, and and uh, then maybe looking at some management options. So that that has been our our trip in in all these projects. So focusing on anchovy and sardine um, as the main maybe historically abundant species in the region. We have been looking at uh, at these different aspects from the species population, a community to the socioeconomics, and then really trying to puzzle all these into a socioeconomic system analysis. Of course, um, when looking at the pelagic systems, um, we realize and uh, and uh, we would like to share it with you how difficult it is to study the systems because they are very dynamic per se and they are difficult to observe. Species move and they are um, they disperse actively. They also migrate actively and they drift because of the currents and because of the oceanography and they are difficult to sample. And they have been subjected to these important long-term changes. So we are studying a snapshot in time, but of course we have to take into account where we are coming from. So the, the historical perspective in the, in the whole change is important. And another important thing is that humans, uh, um, looking at fisheries, but also another activists, are also difficult to observe. So when we are trying to, to incorporate them in our analysis, this is also uh, challenging. To overcome some of these problems, we combine different techniques to generate the key knowledge needed to understand the pelagic systems that were um, range from literature reviews to see what was uh, what was known already, what has been um, identified in the past, field work, laboratory work, and uh, different types of uh, of modeling work. So we went from um, combining, as I said, literature review with oceanographic campaigns, so um, data that arrived to samples that we could uh, retrieve from, from oceanographic campaigns from colleagues from uh, EAO and fisheries-dependent data, so data that comes from, 
from the fishing activity themselves with uh, all the work that comes uh, from dissecting this fish in the lab to to looking at, uh, at their um, content uh, of energy, looking at the stomach contents um, and the stable isotope analysis and uh, also developing some metabarcoding analysis to, to look even more into more detail what they have been eating or the population uh, structure, for example. We've been combining all this information with some statistical modeling and mechanistic models. And finally, we have integrated it in a, in a platform, in a modeling platform that I'm going to present you now. So basically, from a modeling perspective, what we aim is was to, to take the advantage of combining different tools while overcoming some of the limitations that each tool has. So to, to really use the best capabilities of each tool. This is because mathematical modeling cannot fulfill all the goals to understand, predict, and intervene in biology, as Richard Levins in 1966 already um, already recognized. So the idea here was to identify different tools that would either maximize precision and generality as, uh, for example, some, some of the some statistical tools or precision and realism, some of the quantitative modeling that we are doing, or qualitative model generality and realism, and try to incorporate them in, in this figure to the, to the right into a framework that would allow to as to fit some models with outputs of other models and inputs uh, of one model, also reuse them to, to other models. Here, my, my aim is not to show you exactly what, what we have been doing with all these models, but really uh, share with you the rationale of well, all the methods that we have been developing to tackle different questions, and then how we have been linking all these methods to develop uh, this uh, uh, MEM, a marine ecosystem model, using a food web uh, quantitative model with an ecopod with ecosim, and then uh, using it to develop uh, projections to the future. Sorry. OK, so the final, our final aim really is to um, move from what is uh, um, the knowledge that we have from a single species point of view using, for example, uh, stock assessment or, or studies that look uh, uh, very well in very detail one specific, uh, um, one specific aspect or one specific study, moving all the way to an ecosystem-based fisheries management. So our target would be to be at the end of this, all the three projects to be here, to be able to to look at these species from an ecosystem, from a community perspective, taking into account or considering the predators, the competitors, the habitats that they live in, incorporating the climate and um, being able to give some advice from this uh, ecosystem-based fisheries perspective. OK, so now I'm going to walk you through some of the, these uh, sectorial analyses that allow us to um, fill some of these uh, information gaps that we had. And later on, I will bring you all the way to the integration exercise with this, uh, with this MEM that we developed. I'm going to start with the, um, with the genetics uh, um, study. This, this is a study that is um, <clears throat> under development for publication, but the report is already available and you have the link there. So basically what we did here was to conduct a population genetic study using a genotyping through output high, through high throughput sequencing, sorry. With uh, basically what we got is uh, thousands of SNPs that then we could compare and to look at the similarity in these individuals in terms of, uh, of uh, population structure. Here in this map on the top, you see where the samples came from. In this, uh, this example is uh, for sardine, where you see the, the pies correspond to the mean length of the of the organisms that were sampled and, uh, and the different colors um, corresponding to if they were uh, females or males or immatures. So you see that the, the samples that we that we got were already some, but there were some differences between the between the areas that we sampled because of the of the population structure in the in the area that was uh, captured was was different. And this is the one that that we analyzed. But um, what it was interesting to realize at what what the the result of this uh, of this study showed is that basically there's quite an homogeneous uh, homogeneous um, or low differentiation on the on the populations in the whole Mediterranean as you can see in these two figures here, while the Atlantic um, 
individuals that we sampled showed a clear differentiation in terms of the genexis. So we have population, Atlantic population, Mediterranean population, and the Alboran population seems to be in the middle uh, as a as a, trans, a population of a transition between the Atlantic and, and the Mediterranean. So in general, in the Mediterranean, we are talking about one, one species uh, for anchovy and one, one species for sardine. We are uh, now uh, looking at some of the, um, some analysis or further developing this analysis to look at some of the relationship between genome and the, and the environmental patterns to see if we can look at some um, adaptive genetic variability within these ranges. But for now, um, the results that we have are, are these ones. So there's basically very low differentiation between populations. <clears throat> Another study that we did in terms of, uh, of species biology or species health, as I'm calling it here, was uh, to look at uh, changes in body condition, reproduction, growth, and energy. This is a, a study that has been led by Marta Albo, which is a postdoc in, in our group. And basically, what she has been looking at is uh, at these uh, conditions or how the fish are in different locations uh, in, the, in the study area, in the in the Western Spanish uh, uh, Mediterranean area. And uh, she has found some interesting results. For example, for sardine, which is the column in the, in the left, you can see that there's a decline in the length at age, in the, especially in the north. There is a decline in the length of first maturity, so they mature earlier or when they are smaller in the north as well. There is a lower gonosomatic index in the north as well. And there is a decline in the relative condition index. So in the three areas, but especially in the south. So there is some things happening at the at the sardine um, sardine level. We have uh, changes with time, but we also have some differences in the with the north and in the south. There's also a disappearance in the old ages in the north and the central area, which I'm not showing here today, but uh, it's it's also in the in the paper that she is uh, that she submitted. For anchovy, um, what we also found is a temporal decline in the length at age. There is also a temporal decline in the gonosomatic index, um, especially um, significant values are in the in the south. There is also a decline in the condition, and individuals of uh, old age or, or larger age are also gone. I'm not so showing I'm not showing this this results as well. But basically, we are seeing um, longitudinal or uh, sorry a latitudinal gradient where the conditions of the fish are changing, and the condition of the fish seem to be worse in the north than in the south. This uh, matches a little bit with the perception, or we, we did some uh, interviews with fishermen to, to get their perception on how the small pelagics were changing in the area, and many of them were saying that what they were seeing were smaller sizes. This was also what, uh, what was in the news, and it seems to be matching what we are seeing in our data. We have also, from, from a species health, we have also been looking at, uh, at their abundance and their biomasses. And here we took advantage of all the data that we could gather in terms of landings, biomass, and abundance from acoustic surveys and from bottom trawl surveys, both from GCA06, which is the, the one that is presented here, and 07, which would be the, the Gulf of Lions in the, in the north. That it's, this, this data is all published in, in the paper of uh, Maria Gracia Penino, but it's, uh, I'm also only showing here the, the results for the, for the Spanish site of GCA06. And uh, in general, what we see, or what we observe for sardine, we observe fluctuations in abundance, but there is a decline in, in landings and in biomasses, especially from coming from elites. And uh, you, have, you have it um, selected here with a, with a red start. And the small sizes, we also see that with time, the, the samples that we are getting in the, in the, in the acoustic surveys, and sorry, in the bottom trolls are also of a smaller size. I'm not showing these results here, but are also in the paper. For anchovy, on the contrary, we see fluctuations, but for GS06, we see an increase in, uh, in biomasses and in landings. So there's a contrasting pattern that is happening in anchovy from what we are seeing in sardine. However, those increases are not seen in, this, uh, in the north, so in the, in the Gulf of Lions. We were also interesting to, interested to look at uh, the knowledge that we had of uh, what are the environmental factors that are driving uh, anchovy and sardine. So first we conducted a, a literature review looking at all the 
studies that have been published in, in the Mediterranean, in the whole Mediterranean, for anchovy and for sardine. And uh, the first result was basically that these four um, these four uh, um, factors, so temperature, primary production, salinity, and depth, uh, seem to be the ones that are mostly identified to be driving um, variables of uh, sardine and also of anchovy, I'll show you later. Um, uh, dependent variable being biomass, uh, um, landings, uh, abundance, uh, etc. So the different. So we looked at different dependent dependent variables. The interesting uh, side or the interesting result of this review is temperature. Seems that temperature, salinity, and depth seem to have frequently more negative impacts on on sardine distribution than. Uh, um, the chlorophyll, which seems to have a more of a positive impact. So basically what we are seeing here is sardine would be located in less saltier, less warmer and coastal areas related to, or in areas, uh, especially with a high production. And this is, uh, this is what the liter literature seem to seem to be telling us. We use this data to then, um, in a boosted regression tree approach. So this is a species division model approach. We use this to, to this, to, to predict the special the spatial habitats of anchovy and sardine historically. You can see here the, the maps for sardine. Using Here we use presence, absence, and the environmental um, variables that I have mentioned. So here in general, what you are seeing from 2003 all the way to 2017 is that overall, the environmental conditions for sardines seem to be deteriorating, seem to be less um, optimal in the in the study area than they, they were in 2003 when, when the first data, data set is available to us. Um, for anchovy, on the on the contrary, the things are a bit different. So, with this, uh, in terms of environmental factors, we we don't see a clear that that of a clear answer in terms of temperature, chlorophyll, or primary production and salinity. So, there is in the literature studies that show positive but also negative relationship with those uh, environmental variables. But um, most of them conclude or, or show that there is a negative trend as well with depth. So that uh, anchovy seem to be um, also mostly in uh, in coastal areas in in our region. And if we use the same approach as before with the boosted regression tree model, and we project from 2003 all the way to 2017, we can see that contrary to what we were seeing for ants for sardines. Um, apparently, there's a, the environmental conditions would be more most or more favorable for for uh, anchovy in this area where we see um, like kind of an expansion of a of a of a larger uh, optimal area environmental area for for anchovy in 2017 comparing to 2003. Looking or using these uh, boosted regression tree models, we also um, made a projection to the future um, using data sets of uh, two scenarios of climate change on, of uh, the RCP 2.6 and the RCP 8.5 in 2050 and in, to, in uh, 2100. And here you have the results for, for sardine to the left and for anchovy to the right. And um, interesting is uh, to, to realize that while sardine continues to show uh, con construction or, or decrease in the in the habitat uh, that is most suitable because of environmental conditions in the future so there seems to be a, 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 a contraction on the area where the optimal conditions will be for sardine and should be while it was showing the historical period from 2003 to 2017 an expansion um, when we look into the future we see that that expansion at one point will get into a um, turning a tip and then it will also show less less suitable environmental conditions in the future. Filtering these results, so looking at, for example, what is the probability of uh, presence of these species that are uh, higher, that is uh, equal or higher to, to 70%, we identify what we call some climate refuges in the area. We, we also have those results for the Gulf of Lions, but I'm not showing them here. But basically, these areas that you see in the in dark red would be the areas that would be maintained in good environmental conditions for sardine and for anchovy in the in the future, only considering the um, those uh, environmental conditions that I that I explained you before. So 
it seems to be that there will be some refuges, climate refuges for them in the future. Those refuges are declining in surface with, uh, with time. Moving uh, to species roles and, um, and drivers, what we have also been doing is to look at what these species are, are eating. And uh, this, is, uh, this has been a very interesting study led by an eco bachiller, for, um, a colleague uh, that uh, now is in ASTI, and a specialist in uh, stomach content analysis of small pelagics. And here we um, crossed uh, these, uh, these um, studies of, uh, of stomach content with uh, metabarcoding and with uh, stable isotopes. And we uh, found that this is published, so I won't get into much detail, but we have found some interesting information. For example, um, we, uh, we identified that there's a plasticity in the diet of the two species of anchovy and sardine. So, suggesting that there's probably an opportunistic ingestion of what they eat according to what's in the area. And uh, we also see that they are eating different things, or tend to eat different things in the northern part of the area than in the southern part, being larger, and lar like krill and, uh, and other larger uh, prey in the south. And also anchovy seems to have a better capacity to eat these larger prey than sardine. But both of them are eating them in the southern part of the area. Also, in terms of the stable isotopes, we saw that there's a, a lower uh, nitrogen, uh, a stable isotope of nitrogen in the northern area, but we are uh, further analyzing these this results with other type of analysis. So, but all, what we are seeing here is that this latitudinal gradient that we, are, we were seeing in terms of body conditions and growth and reproduction, worse in the north and, and better in, in the south of the study area. We are seeing a similar gradient with the trophic ecology of this species in the north eating smaller things, in the south eating larger and probably more, most, uh, and more energetic, energetic things. Um, we have also incorporated to this study the, a competitor, which would be the Ron Sardinella. And in, uh, for that, we, um, we just zoomed in an area where that species was, um, we also captured that species in the sample, which is in the southern part of, uh, of the study area, where we conducted the same type of, uh, of analysis than uh, we did for anchovy and for sardine. And um, interesting as well, this is, uh, this is work that is, uh, is being under, uh, under review for publication. But we are seeing uh, very interestingly is that uh, um, Sardinella is also showing uh, this uh, um, wider range of prey. So they can basically prey all the way from small diatoms to copepods or larger krill, also anchovy and sardines. So the three species seem to be able to, to eat in the whole spectrum. And uh, However, um, Sardinella seems to be um, being able to, to exploit better some opportunistic resources that would be, for example, gelatinous or plant that we found in the, in the area. We found some, some, uh, some salps in a, in a study in, a, in, a, in a northern area. And here we, saw, uh, we found some apicularian in, in, the, in the stomach content of, uh, of Sardinella. So, Together with this overlapping in diet compositions and some kind of advantage that Sardinella can, can take on some of these opportunity resources, um, may, may um, think that it may be a species that could win in a scenario of a decline in, in zooplankton, in uh, copy pods and a small, zoo, or a small zooplankton, and, and increase in these opportunistic resources like, like jellyfish, for example. While well, doing this analysis of the stomach contents, we and this is a, a, a little bit of a surprise to us, we, we found all these uh, um, microplastic in the stomachs and this is where we started looking at this, uh, at, at, at the, at this other topic uh, with more detail in the anchovy sardine but also in sardinella. And basically this, uh, this study is partially published for anchovy and sardine and it's being reviewed for sardinella. We basically have found microplastics in, in um, more than 50% of the organisms or the individuals of anchovy, sardine, and sardinella that we opened from the study area. And um, with some exceptions, but uh, the, the more microplastics or the, the more prevalence of microplastics that they had in the stomach, the more um, parasites they also had. So those individuals were more parasites were also those that had more um, 
more microplastics. And there's also some, in some cases, they were also related to some, some worse conditions uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of body condition, body health and, and, uh, and growth. So there seems to be a prevalence in the plastics in these species that then seem to be somehow related with more parasites and less body uh, and, and uh, less uh, uh, good body condition, despite we need to, to really look at this uh, or put more effort to try to understand the cause effect relationship of all these uh, of all these factors that we still don't understand there's a second study that is um, also submitted where we looked with uh, colleagues from idaea we looked at the uh, plastificants in the um, in the muscles of anchovies and sardines and also one of the predators which is hake to see if uh, the muscle um, in these uh, these plastics are also in, in being accumulated in the muscle of these species. This is something that will come up hopefully in the in the near future. So moving on, um, I'm going to show you now some results from what we did in terms of predators. First, we wanted to look at uh, how important these small pelagics, especially anchovy and sardine, were for for the predators in the region. But also, we incorporated sardinella as a, as a third. Uh, uh, forage fish in in the area and also the European spratus, 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 which is also another species that uh, occurs in some parts of the area, especially in in the northern parts. First, we conducted a, a literature review where. Um, we identified all, all the information that is available in terms of who is eating anchovy, sardine, um, uh, sardinella and spratus. And uh, we identified quite a lot of uh, organisms that would be relying on these species with uh, a variable contribution to their diet. And you can see here um, that we identify not only fin fish or or, uh, or the traditional fish, but also seabirds, elasmo branch, marine mammals, and uh, even uh, uh, some crustaceans, some uh, some cephalopods, and and uh, another another group. So there's it's really um, it's really a, they are they are some species that are very important in the in the in the food web as we were anticipating and there's quite a lot of data about that when you look at specifically at each individual species then you realize that there's um, some predators specialized in the different species so here you have in the center the the result for sardine or for anchovy and uh, and um, it's a very small so you won't be able to read it but the species that that are really targeting one specific species are different so so uh, they uh, there seem to be some specialization for for them and uh, it's also an interesting uh, pattern that we found in these reviews that uh, while sardine seems to be more important for predators in the in the western mediterranean anchovy seems to be more important for the predators in the eastern mediterranean we still don't know why this may be it's probably related with the abundances of this relative abundance of these two species in the in the different regions of the mediterranean this uh, this remains to be further further analyzed in the future in the projects, we also um, wanted to look specifically at some of the diets of the of these uh, predators that had been identified. And uh, colleagues from the group, uh, Juan Navarro and Juan Jimenez, looked at some of these uh, these species in detail. So we have little tuni, we have the Atlantic uh, bonito and the swordfish here. This is published, so I won't go into much detail. But basically, what uh, what we found is uh, here we we looked at uh, at three different tissues. So we uh, we looked at a liver, we look at muscle, and we look at fin because they integrate different. Uh, time periods of the um, of the contribution of the of the prey into the into the um, into the organism, so they relate different to the to the values of the stable isotope values that we find, and basically what uh, what we could see here is uh, is a preference of uh, of uh, for example Atlantic uh, bonito um, would prefer uh, European sardine or on sardinella while um, Little Tony would prefer, and the long, in the long-term scale would prefer anchovy. So, contrast or complementing a little bit what we found in the literature. We were also interesting to interested to see if we could use these uh, predators to track changes in small pelagics with time, and for that we took advantage of some. Uh, um, some samples that colleagues from EO 
are, are sharing with us. So for little Tuni, we developed the second analysis that you hear in the in the right, where we looked at uh, with the stomach content and with the stable isotope, where they have been looking, what they have been eating from 2012 to 2017 for four years, where we we had uh, for the, where we had data. And basically, um, we found some also some interesting results. We found that, that the changes of the the proportion of uh, the biomass. Um, of uh, or the, the relative importance of uh, anchovy was changing in the diet. Also, um, the size of sardine that they were eating was changing. But also, we saw an increase in the importance of the mersal amid the pelagic resources on this uh, little tuna. In uh, if we compare 2012 to 2017, so there seems to have been some changes in the diet that uh, may or may not represent what has been changing in the in the environmental conditions. Okay, and finally, to, to finish with the predators, just let me showcase, uh, this is another study that has been led by Elena Juret, a PhD student on our group. She looked at uh, hake. Hake is, a, is a basically a demersal uh, species, a fish species, but also uh, shows some mentopelagic or some, uh, some tendency to, to go into the water column, especially at night, to to feed and feeds partially on a small pelagics of anchovy and sardine. So we wanted to look at the importance of um, of uh, where this species is distributed, which environmental factors affect it, and if uh, the trough the trophism or the availability of prey also affects this uh, this uh, predator. And uh, here in the in the figure and the on the right, you can see the, the changes between summer and, and winter on the on on some uh, categories of prey, while the, the hake uh, increases in size. And uh, cluster one and cluster five would be the ones that include small pelagics. And you can see that there's a relative increase in importance of this, uh, of this species when, when hake uh, um, increases in size. At one point, it, it declines. So it seems that uh, hake is relying on anchovy and sardine when it's, uh, when it's getting bigger and when it's uh, growing and it's able to, to really go to the water column. So confirming this, this break, this, uh, this predation event. <clears throat> Moving to the to the roles, uh, to the, from the roles to the drivers, we looked at fisheries and, and especially we, uh, within the Spermid project, we conducted some stock assessments of anchovy and sardine. This was done also by, by a colleague from, uh, from the Institute, from, from John Ramirez, that now is a postdoc in Ireland. And he, for the first time, uh, was able to to apply um, what it's called a, a catch, uh, catch at H or A4A uh, model, a stock assessment, in addition to other types of models to sardine and also to anchovy, and really um, use the most up-to-date and most accurate data that we had from the fisheries in these two species in terms of landings. Here you have the, the landings in, uh, in the two regions, which would be Tramontana Levantina, which is basically GCA6 uh, and of the of the of the western mediterranean the the long term changes in catches and then that in addition with the partition of these catches per per age groups and per per size um he was able to to apply to this stock assessment and it's interesting to to see that these are the these are some results that we got in 2017 and this year they are being updated to 2021 and they will be released by GFCM in the near future but uh, both uh, stock assessment for the area basically suggested that the both species mostly sardine but also anchovy were <clears throat> were being uh, overfished and uh, or had been overfished and were being overfishing. So the, the role of uh, fisheries in, in some of the, the trends that we were seeing seemed to be in, important until until 2017. And uh, here in this panel, for example, you can see changes in, in recruitment and in sardine is very clear a, a decline, no, a, a trend to decline in recruitment, changes in the spawning stock biomass, changes in the catch, and then an increase in the in the fishing mortality of the of the species. <clears throat> trying also moving to more in integrative analysis and trying to cross uh, the results that we got from the environmental side to the results that we got from the fishery side, we. Uh, um, with uh, with Fran Ramirez also from uh, from the institute, uh, um, a postdoc in in my group, we try to um, apply the safe operational space concept to our 
uh, to our problematic to really identify those areas that would uh, show less uh, um, less impacts of fishing and would be optimally uh, environmentally optimal for anchovy and sardine this is this is a uh, these two studies are published, so I won't, into the, won't go into detail, but the interesting part of this is basically he found that those areas um, for sardine that have been deteriorating the most in terms of environment were also those areas that were, were concentrating the most fishing historically or on in, the, in a recent period. So those areas that seem to be where anch or where sardines are having a hard time because of the environmental conditions are also those areas that we are concentrating the fishing on them. And that also happened the same for for anchovy. Those areas, the, the analysis were a bit, a bit different, but those areas that were improving the least in terms of environmental conditions for, for anchovies were also those areas that were concentrating the, the fisheries. So uh, interesting uh, um, to find this uh, this uh, special congruence of the between between fisheries and and climate in terms of the stressors of these two species that this could maybe we we argue in the paper that could be compromising the resilience of these species for for future climate change events. Okay, so to this point. Um, I brought you to, to all the, the results and we're basically now I'm going to show you how we have integrated all this in this, uh, what we call this, uh, this special temporal marine ecosystem model or AMEM. What uh, basically we have done is uh, uh, bring all the results and, uh, and information, previous information from the study area in terms of, uh, of uh, the key species of the small pelage, which are also the predators, the competitors, um, into the parameterization of the initial conditions. Then we have used uh, all the information of the of the drivers, from the fisheries drivers, from environmental drivers, into this the temporal and the spatial uh, part of the model, and uh, with. Uh, with the aim to to really obtain some predictions of where the species have been, where the species may be, and then use them to test some scenarios of of change of management and climate change for the future. <clears throat> we did this. Uh, the the main uh, core of the spatial temporal model is a uh, is an eco space model, and I won't go into details here, but basically the ecospace model is, is a quantitative model for marine ecosystems that have been around at least in the 80s. There is a basic routine that provides like a snapshot of how the, the structure and the, and the flows of, of, um, of the species and in, in the food web, how they are structured, and then uh, how the production and the consumption flows and how they matches. Then there is a temporal uh, part of the model with basically uh, simulates uh, the ecosystem effects of uh, mortal uh, changes in mortalities and mortalities because of predation mortality, but also could be fishing mortality or also changes in the environmental conditions. And this is done through a series of time-dependent differential equations. And after that, there is the ecospace model that basically brings that into into a special domain where it predicts how how the biomasses, how the groups, and how the different components of the of the ecosystem will will um, distribute in a in a two dimensional space. So very very briefly. Basically, in this uh, in this work I'm going to show you today, we took advantage of the benefits of EWE modularity. It's really a very uh, open tool where you can incorporate data from from different models, from different data sets. So um, this was uh, this allowed us to bring in all the diff different components that we have been generating in the sectorial results or sectorial studies that I showed you before. We used um, there is a a special temporal data framework that we call is basically a GIS a data intercha interchange tool that allow us to bring in, in this case here in this figure in the center, you have uh, projections of how temperature salinity, um, primary production will change according to, to a model that uh, uh, Diego Macias has been sharing with us from from uh, from the SIC and from GRC, and we have been driving our our model with, for example, these changing conditions. And there's also the capacity to link ecospace to what we call a species distribution model and each model, and really interlink the dynamics of the food web with the dynamics of uh, of an each model. So uh, to change the environmental conditions and how those environmental conditions. Um, 
are impacting the, the species and, and the movement and the interactions in the food web. And now I'm going to present you some of the results that uh, that we have been getting from incorporating all the information that we that we generated. I, I forgot to tell that uh, basically to do this, we, we used a model that had been developed by Xavier Corrales in 2015. And that model we ha has been um, um, so I've been, we incorporated new components of the system and then we fitted it to data and we also specialized it. But this is uh, the base core of the of, uh, of this work is, is a model that, that he developed. Here to the left, you can see the food web uh, matrix represented in what we call an energy flow diagram from an anchovy and from a sardine point of view. So you can see how central they are in the, in the flow of, uh, of energy in, the, in our study area. And to the to the right, you can also uh, um, th this is a matrix of interactions. When you we we use it to try to understand who impacts whom. So the impacting groups are in the rows, and the impacted are in the so impacting in the rows, the impacted in the columns. And uh, for example, here we can we can already identify that the main um, impacting between a small pelagic fish would be sardine and anchovy. It doesn't seem to be a lot of, uh, in 2000 at least, because this represents 2000, a lot of impacting interaction between sardinella, spratus, and the rest of the species. That's an interesting result. If we move to the temporal um, results that we are getting from this model, here you can see changes in small pelagics with time, larger for sardine, as we have been observing with, uh, with landings and with uh, biomasses um, in the surveys than uh, than for the rest of the species. What is interesting here to, re to show is that uh, the two um, RCP scenarios that we run, 4.5 uh, and 8.5, don't show very contrasting results. Well, um, so there's uh, there's really, in in terms of what this model and what the drivers are giving us, uh, doesn't seem to matter that much if we are in a moderate or in an extreme climate change event. And this is something that we're going to to be looking at more into the in the future, of course. We now can look at the perspective of uh, of other species, for example, of predators and uh, and of key key species of the system. And uh, here, to the on the bottom, on the top, sorry, you see trajectories of change for some of these species. And interesting enough, we see some increases of uh, Atlantic bluefin tuna and jellyfish, as we have already been seeing in the in the news and uh, and in some of the of the data. But also of uh, non-commercial large pelagic fish that we have much less data. Those would would be sunfish and basking sharks mainly. Another keystone species uh, would be declining, for example, hake or blue sharks. While cephalopods that we were also expecting to, to, to have some, or the, the model to predict some increases, we see fluctuations with not, there's not a real increase in our, in our model, at least in this configuration. To the right, you see the, the projected uh, distributions of biomass in 2030 compared to 2000, so the initial um, year of the model. If we look into what's, what may be happening with the fisheries, we kind of start looking at uh, which interactions occur between fisheries themselves, where it's interesting to see, for example, there's some some clear trade-offs between fleets is a negative impact between artisanal fleet and long liners or bottom trawlers with recreational fisheries and uh, and uh, interesting enough there doesn't seem to be much of an interaction or negative interaction between bottom trawlers and poor seiners which would be what we were expecting because of uh, of their um special overlap but we this is also something that we need to look at more in the, into into the future we also see interactions with uh, fishing and pelagic species and for example this in terms of the spanish fleet we see the poor seiners would be the ones that affect most both uh, adults uh, of sardines and anchovies as well as the as the uh, french fleet that i'm putting less emphasis in in this uh, presentation and there's a slight positive impact of small pelagics uh, of trawlers probably because of the removals of some of the of the predators these are the kind of analysis that you can obtain from the, this uh, integrated uh, integ integrated perspective we are now moving into what uh, is the the model projecting in terms of uh, of changes in fisheries here you see the, what the model projects in terms of catches of the of anchovy and sardine, juvenile and adults for the two RCP scenarios, and we are seeing uh, declines in mostly um, sardine, also some in anchovy, but anchovy shows 
quite a lot of fluctuation with some years with very probably very good recruitment so increases in catches and other years with a decline but overall um, as we are seeing as well in the observed uh, data uh, sardine is is doing worse and it's predicted to be worse uh, doing worse than than anchovy <clears throat> We look at the overall projections of the model, we and we identify those uh, those groups from the pelagic compartment, the demersal, and also invertebrates that that show most changes. With our projections, you you could see that there's some some clear uh, losers of uh, what may what may happen in the future with these increases. I forgot to say that all these scenarios are um, business as usual. So considering that we continue fishing the way we are doing and there is this this climate uh, um, climate change happening according to to the to the models that we are using to drive those those simulations so if uh, if that would be reality what we are seeing is some declines in in sardines some declines in in other pelagic species that mackerels some declines in the demersal component like uh, like hakes um, and also in the in Salema, for example, interesting species that, that would also be declining. But also we we see some some winners. Um, one winner is the Atlantic uh, Atlantic bluefin tuna, which is also has been to been shown in the news as a, as appearing pentapelagic uh, species as well. There's uh, mullets, red mullets seem to be benefiting from the situation of high fishing and and changing climate conditions and uh, rays and skates um, and also some invertebrates. Interesting enough, we don't, we don't identify cephalopods as big, big winners of, the, of this change as well. Uh, we were expecting, it was a hypothesis that we had that has not, has not been, or at least the, pro, the model is not, has not been showing that. <clears throat> and finally, I'm going to show you um, what we are planning to do or what we are doing with this, with this MEM when uh, when it's properly calibrated and we are happy with what we are seeing what uh, showing the past we are mm, planning to use it to look at some alternative management options here you see for example what what we have been playing with with uh, have been playing with uh, changing uh, effort for example reducing fishing effort by 50 percent for all the fleets in the in the area or placing some uh, some marine protected areas in this case would be marine protected area in a coastal uh, zone to protect the, the juveniles of, uh, of small pelagics. The other one would be protect those climate refuges that we had identified as persistently good areas uh, in terms of environmental conditions. So if you do that, well here you can see in this in this figure, you have the two extremes. The, in the column to the to the left, you have where we are now and where where we may be in 2030 if we continue doing what we are doing, which basically are uh, seeing a decline in in biomasses for all the pelagic uh, the, the two pelagic species and a decline in the catches. The other extreme is what is the model telling us that we would be in 2030 if we would close completely the fisheries now and remain it closed for for 10 years to 2050 so basically we see um, a rebuilding of the biomasses uh, not for juvenile anchovy probably because we are fish we are closing everything so there is a uh, some uh, some uh, food web interactions and probably some predation mortality going on there but th those are the two extremes and um we want to use this platform is to to start analyzing the options that we have in between so the option that would be for example so uh, closing 50% of the fisheries, which would be the second column to the left, or um, implementing this uh, this coastal area, or implementing the the refuges for the climate refuges, combining both of them, and when we combine both of them, we start seeing some interesting interesting results that um, that the catches would decline, but you still see or starting to see some rebuilding of the of the biomasses at sea, and then the probably what it seems in, in this uh, compendium of uh, of a scenarios that we tested what seems to be an interesting um yeah an interesting management scenario to to further test is a combination of a reduction of the fishing effort 50 percent reduction with the the incorporation of some of these uh, marine protected areas into the into the system we looked uh, at the same results in the, the scenario of uh, RCP 8.5 and, and uh, results don't, don't change that much. What uh, it changes a little bit is for sardine. You have here to the 
to the right top where sardine, because of its more constraint for environmental conditions, seems to be doing a bit worse under an RCP 8.5. Uh, that would be the, the only main change that we, we see between anchovy and sardine. Okay, so I'm arriving to, to the end. I think I'm, I'm being quite uh, quite long already. So let me quickly get you into what we have learned. So basically, we generated this uh, key biological and ecological new data. So we uh, we confirmed that there's a low population dissimilarity in the area. There's high trophic plasticity and there's high importance of this species for for the predators. And we have also updated the the knowledge that we have about the status of sardine and anchovy. Um, and uh, I won't go through all of these, but uh, basically, there's quite some worrisome um, indicators that show us that they are not in their in their best possible conditions. And there uh, seems to be a latitude in a gradient that shows that probably they are worse in the north than than in the south. And it's probably related to both a combination of of climate and and uh, and uh, fishing uh, fishing conditions. We've um, uh, further analyze what is the, the role of these species in the system and starting to, to identify which may be the winners and the, and the losers of these observed changes that we are seeing in our area. And we would uh, argue that now we have a prototype, um, a marine ecosystem model prototype that we can uh, in the future test, uh, use to test these management alternatives that, uh, th that need to be, to be there and probably need to be strong to to curb the trends around that we are seeing for, for anchovy and for sardine and also for other uh, other resources in the area. And this is uh, dedicated to to the anchovies and the sardines of the area. But I, I won't finish here. I want to, to finish um, by telling you that, of course, uh, our model is wrong. And uh, <clears throat> quoting uh, what, uh, what uh, George uh, Box said, that uh, all models are wrong, but some may be, may be useful. And uh, what we are aiming is to to continue developing this this platform to make it uh, uh, even uh, to make it more useful for the future we are going to, to further feed the model and validate it we want to test different uh, management scenarios in incorporating the the new proposals or implementations that are on the table also the the safe operational space concept that we haven't tested yet into a management proposal or um, incorporating alternative climate projections because uh, for now we are using one of the models that for example in this figure here shows that are different alternatives and we would like to to test what what would be the impact of changing the drivers of uh, of our of our system, we are also going to consider adaptation from the ecological and the social economic point of view, and uh, we are going to be looking at the economic values of some of the species that we are including, for, because now the economic representation of in the system is is very poorly represented. Um, further methodological developments are are on the way, and uh, let me basically uh, mention that. Uh, we are here, so I think we, we have achieved uh, uh, basically notoriously uh, what we wanted to achieve in terms of uh, position ourselves in in the contributing or being able to contribute for an ecosystem-based fisheries management, but our main goal, or we want to get the golden star, we want to be here, we really want to use this type of approaches to to an ecosystem-based management. And for that, we need to work much harder in this kind of, in generating knowledge of our area, but also in, in generating the capacity to integrate all this knowledge. Because um, the, the study area, the Northwestern, the Western Mediterranean is one of the, the key areas where there is all these uh, blue growth activities being uh, being planned or being happening. And this kind of approaches we think are, are going to be needed or necessary in the future. And with that, I, I finished. I, I would like to thank everybody that contributed to this work, which are many, uh, many of, uh, of my colleagues uh, um, from EAO, from ECM, and uh, some, some people that came to ECM, and now they are somewhere with their postdocs to all of them, uh, and, and also to all the students. Thank you, because they contributed massively, and the success of these projects is, uh, basically belongs to them. And with that, I, I finish, and I thank you very much for for your attention. And sorry for being so so long. <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Marta, for, for this talk and for this presentation. Uh, you have shown an impressive amount of data, moving from uh, genetics, population genetics, distributions, traffic ecology, who eats these fishes, uh, what do they eat as well, 
how distribute the modeling. Uh, so really integrating is uh, perhaps is the word of everything that you are doing, no? just to try to integrate some so different amount and types of, of data. That was a very interesting talk. So I think we have now uh, time for the people, not, not, not very long time, but uh, if the, there are questions here in the chat, we can just address them. Um, I have a, one question to start with. So th this, I, I, I read this um, new that Tana Fishes perhaps were participating in the decline of sardinas. And, and the data that you show me agree with this data. When I, when I read it, I thought, well, it's not possible that the top predator is really controlling this <coughs> but you think that this is part of true that tuna 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 fish uh, is part of the decline of the these small pelagic fishes yeah that's a tricky question i um i don't well the the models show that there has been an increase in the tuna and that's mainly because there has been a decline in the in the fish in the fishing mortality that tuna was subjected to so if we consider that our study our model starts in in 2000 in the, those years tuna was really really low because uh, uh, because of the high fishing mortality mm -hmm. so of course this when we're studying this period of time, we see this this in, uh, the recovery of tuna, and the the logical thing to do to to do is to think that oh, there's more tuna. They are fishing. They are eating all the fish. Um, the problem is that um, the the data shows that uh, anchovies and sardine were already very low when tuna was very low. So something else was hap was happening then that uh, probably tuna is now contrib may maybe contributing to to put pressure, but it's not the main uh, it's not it's not the main cause of that they have been declining all these years, and pro and probably now we are seeing aggregation of tuna in in fisheries operations because tuna need to eat something and probably the the populations of pelagics are very low in the area they learn fast and they learn where to go they adapt and this is something that in the group we are starting to look at with Valerio Spragaglia and how how species adapt to the to the conditions so the yeah the answer is not that simple it's not a yes it's a maybe an I don't know but I don't think so <laughs> okay I don't think so either so and also it's funny that you have like a, a full sector who is sampling for you. No, you are studying tana, um, sardines and anchovy, and you have a sector of the fishermen that are, is sampling for you. But at the same time, uh, you say that this is not so easy to to study the, the activities. No? The, well, we have been. Uh, yeah, the, the, this project is, is these projects are special because we are working in collaboration with uh, EO, and they have these uh, these broad uh, observations uh, of observatories that they can go and sample. So we we took advantage of that, but we also established our own observation um, strategy where we went to the harbors every month and and uh, collected uh, information from the fishermen. So we we have established different ways of collecting the data so mm. but yeah the fishermen are yeah sometimes they are not easy and these um these fisheries they act at night which means that they they uh, they come uh, to the harbor very early in the morning um sometimes five o'clock six o'clock and they leave very late so monitoring them is not easy either mm -hmm. we have some questions here in the chat there is one question from marta rivas that she asked would you have any recommendation for the feeding habitats in terms of fish consumption you mean from the human perspective, I guess? Yeah, I think it's from the CSPDC, also Netflix documental, that they just yeah. uh, advise not to eat any fish, I think, that part of the question, I guess. Yeah, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't seen it. Okay. <laughs> I, um, in, in a normal situation where, where things are managed sustainably, sustain, uh, like eating fish, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very good thing to do because they, from the nutrition point of view, they have uh, all, the, all the benefits. In our specific situation now, well, I would recommend maybe eating, eating anchovy and, uh, and uh, leaving uh, sardine for, for when they are a bit uh, more abundant at the sea. But uh, this is something that um, that also changes with time, so that's, uh, it's difficult. Thank you. There is another question from Eva, uh, and she asks, related with one of your last slides and your wish of improving and integrating all the relevant information into a better management of resources, which is nice. And then she asks, what? How receptive is the administration to implement what seems to be a strong measures? So that is the next step, no? From the mouth of the administration. This is being uh, recorded, so I'll be uh, very polite about it. 
Um, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, but it's probably a good idea that we all sit down and start looking at at this problem from a from an ecosystem perspective. That's a, that's our aim is to have the tools to be able to deliver them to whoever wants to use them. And, and to look at them, administration, but also consumers, uh, fishers, um, NGOs that that would like to to look at alternative uh, scenarios. There are many congratulations in the in the in the, in the chat, and then you will have the chat later, then you can just thank you. <laughs> uh, I have another question, which is perhaps is a minor thing, but uh, you said that the. the Plastics in the in the stomachs of the fishes they were related to the parasites. Uh, what, are they, what parasites there were? Well, the, we found. I mean, we don't know what is the cause. We don't know if the parasites are there, so the the um, individuals are in bad states, so they are less able to feed on what they like, so they can of uh, feed on what they can and they eat more more plastics, or the other way around, because they are eating plastics and they are having a worse condition and they get more parasites. We don't we don't really know. It's something that surprised us as well. It's, it's a correlation that we found. We don't know what is the causation, but what it's in the data is that who whoever has more plastic in the stomach has also more parasites. And parasites because you see them. I mean worms yeah, are yeah. Yeah, they are they are intestinal parasites. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think there is not a very strong activity in the chat, but I think you, you explained a lot of things. It was very 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 interesting talk. So I think we can leave it here. Uh, thank you very much for for this presentation, Matt. I think it was very useful, and I think it has been a, a very nice uh, talk within this symposium um, series of talks which is something that uh, I think has a, a little bit broader audience for the talks that we used to do. And I, I just want to finish my, this, this talk just announcing and remembering, uh, well, remembering, <laughs> announcing the talk, uh, the next symposium that's going to happen in one month, the 24th of June, by Diego Macias, uh, in the Instituto de Ciencias Marinas de Andalucía. And the title of this talk is going to be Marine Science Supporting Policy Making, which is part of the um, uh, the Eva's question. So uh, I am closing it here. Thank you very much, uh, Marta, and all the people that have attended to this session. Okay, thank you.